That's right, we bought a house while in collections and without a contingency. In this episode of our new home series, I'm gonna be sharing what we did to be able to do that, the obstacles that we overcame along the way, the hard choices that we had to make, and what it looked like when we crossed the finish line, including all of the financial details. Yes, real numbers of the purchase of our new home. So stick around to find out how it all played out. Welcome to The Budget Bounce. If we haven't met yet, I'm Jen, and we talk all about living life on a budget, saving for our future, paying down our debt, and all the life that happens along the way on our road to financial freedom. If that's something you're interested in, then make sure you hit that subscribe button down below and tap the bell so you'll get notified every time I post a new video. We've been working on getting our money right for three years now, and that's included paying down our debt, not taking out any additional debt, and building our, our savings, including like our emergency fund and our sinking funds so that we have money to cash flow life and all the curveballs that it throws at us. And if you haven't been along for the ride, we've had a few of them along the way. And our hard work paid off when we decided rather quickly to buy a new home and closed on it just seven weeks later. All of this happened in spite of us both having collections accounts on our credit reports and we were able to buy our new home without the contingency clause to sell our, our existing home before we could close on the new home. And just two and a half years earlier, my credit score had bottomed out at about 515 during a family financial crisis that we went through that led to us doing all the things I'm about to share with you. So let me start with a little bit of the backstory about that. So in the it was like may or june of 2018 my credit score bottomed out at about 515 it might have dipped a little bit lower than that and this was after years of it being sustained like 15 years my score had been 700 or higher and for probably 10 of those it was 750 to 800. so when this all happened it was so devastating and traumatizing for me matt's score also was it would have been worse than mine. It absolutely was worse than mine, but we didn't have the guts to check it at the time. We just left that alone. Um, I'm guessing he was probably down below 500. So let's talk about what we did to get to the point that we were able to do this, buying a new home with collections accounts on our credit reports and not having to have a contingency to sell our old home. There were six key things that we did over the, cor the course of time. It was about two and a half years between you know when we started in February 2018 and when this all uh, came to a head in late 2020. So the first thing we did was we'd been paying down our debt. We had been working on that for almost three years and by the time we started this process, we had paid off over 80,000 of our original starting debt. Now, the lenders couldn't see 80,000 anywhere. They don't see those numbers. What they see is what's left and because it was significant, really significantly reduced, it really helped our chances of being approved. The second thing we did was we stopped taking on new consumer debt. And this was really tough out of the gate because we were not in a good financial position. We weren't able to make all of our, our payments. Matt wasn't working. So we were down in income and we, our spending habits were like crazy off the charts. We weren't tracking anything for nine years, you guys. It was bad. The thought of not taking on new debt to help us, you know, get through the month was really scary and really hard. But you know what was harder and scarier was continuing with what we were doing. So we made it all stop right then and there. February 1st, 2018, we have not taken out any more consumer debt. The third thing we did was we always pay our bills on time and even early if we can. And here's the thing about that. In, in the, the depths of our financial crisis in 2017 and 2018, I was robbing Peter to pay Paul to get through the month every month. And we stopped paying things not on, not only not on time, we were paying late and some things, many things we stopped paying at all. I was 45 years old and had never not paid all my bills. This was an incredibly difficult time for me. I, I really struggled. Matt was sick. I'm not saying he's not, he wasn't struggling during this time. I'm saying he had a whole other set of issues that he was dealing with. So this is what I was going through. And it felt so good when we were able to, you know, come around the corner just a few months later after we started budgeting to be able to pay all of our debts 
all of our bills, everything on time and have the money when we needed it. And we even started paying some things early. The fourth thing that we did is we have been very selective about what credit accounts that we use. So let me start by saying we didn't use credit at all for probably the first two years after all this started, but we started using it again for uh, rewards and for our credit scores, because as much as I don't want to admit that the credit score matters, I want to be able to say that it doesn't matter. It does matter. It has impacted several things throughout our journey the last three years. And I just, I think that it is important that we recognize that because there are things that are completely outside of our control that the credit score affects, that your credit report affects. So when we started using credit again, we were very selective about the accounts we used, how much credit we utilized at any one time, and we pay the balance off. Actually, I don't pay it off every month. I pay it off like every other day. I'm going in and paying whatever is posted so that we are always showing that we are um, paying on time and that we are carrying very, very low balances, if any at all. And that shows our ability to manage revolving accounts and our credit worthiness. The fifth thing that we have done is we have worked to protect our credit scores and reports in terms of the number of hard inquiries that show up on it. And that really became kind of second nature and an easy win when we stopped taking out new consumer debt. The sixth thing that we did was we decided to make 2020 the year of savings for us. And we actually made that decision in late 2019 as we were planning for the upcoming year. And then, of course, the pandemic hit in March, April, when, when the world kind of started shutting down all around us here in the States and also in other parts of the world. And so we were really glad that we had shifted to focus on uh, building our savings and, and talking about like liquid savings, right? An emergency fund and our sinking funds and things like that. And we started contributing to our retirement plans again, which helped build up those accounts. But we had some obstacles in our way. Even with all those things that we've been doing well for the last two and a half years, there were things that we needed to overcome. The biggest thing was Matt and I both had collections accounts on our credit reports. Matt had 10 to 12 on his report and I had one on mine. So the first thing I asked my mortgage guy when I got on the phone with him, yes, I have a mortgage guy. I've bought three houses. I've refinanced a couple of times. You know, I've done this before. So I called him and said, hey, listen, this is what we have going on. I'm just telling you, even before you run the reports, this is what you're going to see. What kind of impact is that going to have? And I let him know that if this was going to be a showstopper, we were going to not proceed because I'm talking to him obviously before we made an offer and we didn't want to go any further if we weren't going to be able to get approved. We loved this house and we, we did not want to get our hopes up only to be crushed later. And you know, it's also the right thing to do when you are going through the process, you need to be pre-approved. You have to be pre-approved before you can officially make an offer anyway. So as we talked through it, you know, he, he, acknowledged that Matt's report was going to be problematic with so many accounts on it, but he wasn't concerned about my report with just the one derogatory account on it. And one of the main reasons is it was less than 10% of my total revolving installment debt that was showing up on my credit report. So, and on top of that, I had two years, over two years of payments that I had been making on it that I could provide proof of to show that I had been steadily working to pay that particular account down. So it became a non-issue on my report. After that, we made the hard choice of not including Matt on the mortgage. There were a number of factors that played into that, one including his score. It was in the low 600s and it was not going to help us. We were actually concerned it might hinder us in the rate and, and whatnot and in the approval process. And also the fact that he had so many uh, collections accounts and derogatory remarks on his report and his history, it just wasn't going to work well for us. Also, he has back child support. And the thing about that is if you have back child support at the time that you take a mortgage, if you're on the mortgage, they will. And then if later you want to sell your home before you have paid off the back child support, the back child support becomes a lien on your home. 
and at about 28k it was actually closer to 29k at the time we were not interested in adding that kind of a lien on our mortgage out of the gate add in the fact that my income is enough to support the mortgage underwriting process and that is how we landed with matt not being on the loan for the new house so once we got through that process then we had a bunch of stuff we had to do before we could cross the finish line so once we made the decision to use my income only, that reduced the amount of consumer debt by quite a bit. I had about 30K in consumer, you know, revolving in installment debt on my report, and then I had 108K in mortgage debt from our existing home at the time that we were, we were working to, to buy our new home. Add in my moderately high uh, income level as compared to the loan that we were trying to get, and my much improved credit score, which was in the high 600s. Plus, because we had been working on building our savings, we had plenty of cash on hand to cover all of the, the pre-closing costs and the day of closing costs, and then some. In the end, I was able to qualify for an FHA loan that requires 3.5% for the down payment and PMI, or private mortgage insurance, if the uh, loan amount is greater than 80% of the value of the home, which was our our situation. Plus, interest rates had dropped in our favor on the day that we were trying to lock in our rate and, and you know, get, get the ball rolling officially so we could make this offer. Uh, our lender was able to lock in 2.625% for us. And compared to the 4.5% that we're paying on the conventional loan we had on our old home, this was a fantastic rate and we were really excited about that. And through all of those conversations, we also learned that we did not have to put a contingency clause into the contract when we made the offer. What that means is we did not have to put a clause in that said we would have to sell our old home before we could officially buy the new home. And all sellers, they want to avoid contingency clauses whenever they can. So this was fantastic news for them and for us because it was coming into winter and we knew we were going to have a tough time turning it around within two weeks to get it on the market, but that's not enough. You have to actually sell it. And with winter coming, the odds of selling were going to be a lot lower. Not that they wouldn't happen, but a lot lower. And so we needed to see if we could do this. So I nerded out and did all the number crunching to see if we could sustain two mortgages for a few months. And when it was all said and done, we made an offer. You guys know that I am always up for a good old fashioned spreadsheet. So let's jump over to the one that I created for this to show you all of the numbers associated with the purchase of our new home. While I'm doing that, drop an emoji below to share how much you love or maybe hate a good spreadsheet. All right, so here we are with the spreadsheet that I created to be able to break all this down for you guys. What you'll see here is on the left is the description of the item that I'm going to des describe. Then I have two sets of columns. I've got the buyer paid, that's us, what we paid, and then the seller paid items. And then that's broken down further of what we had to pay at closing versus what we had to pay before we ever got to the closing table. So the things that were before closing, like we would have been out that money no matter what, even if it fell through and we didn't end up buying the house, we would have had to pay this money unless we stopped the process sooner. Um, we would have had to pay this money out of pocket. So the total loan costs were $6,502 and that's broken down into origination costs, services you cannot shop for is what they call this category and services that you can shop for. So we bought some points for $590 and then we had processing fees for the origination of the loan of $1,170. That came to 1,760. Then in the services you can't shop for, they picked who the appraisal company was going to be and that cost $515. And then the lender of course ran our credit report. They had to do a flood certification and there was mortgage insurance premium that had to be paid. So that total section came to $3,703. In the services you can shop for, the total was 1,038, and that's broken down by the pest inspection, which we got to pick who we wanted to uh, come and 
do that. And then there was, it says services you can shop for, but I mean, I don't, wouldn't even know how to shop for all these title services, but you can see there are several things here that added up to, you know, like a thousand ish dollars. So the total here is 1,038. So these bold numbers, 1760, 3703, 1038, they add up to the $6,502. The next category they gave us was other costs. So let's keep in mind, if you've ever bought a house, you know that you get like, like a stack of paperwork, right? Now they have moved away from that. The last time I had bought a home was nine years ago and um, they were doing all paper back then, but this time they gave us a summary, which is what I used to create this and a thumb drive with all of our documents on it. Oh, let me insert a picture of the um of closing day i actually took a couple of pictures of the stack of signed documents that i that uh i had to do that day so let's see here um other costs four thousand one hundred one dollars total so uh within that there was taxes and other government fees of 130 dollars that was for recording the deed and the mortgage and then there was transfer taxes to county recorder. So this is something that was paid for by the seller and that was 277. That number is not included over here. The prepaids were, uh, first of all, we had to pay a whole year of home, homeowner's insurance. So 12 whole months of $1,683. The mortgage insurance premium was addressed up at the top. So it didn't show up here. And then there was prepaid interest for the remainder of December. So we closed on Friday, December 18th and took possession that day. And we had to pay through the end of the month at $13 and six cents per day, which came out to $182. We didn't have to pay property taxes because actually that ended up getting paid by the sellers. Let's move on to initial escrow payment at closing. So escrow, if you're not sure what that is, that is where um, you have to have an escrow account for uh, lots of different types of home loans. But for an FHA loan, you have to have an escrow account to handle all of your property taxes and your homeowners and in homeowners insurance. And please uh, forgive me if I didn't state that correctly, but we had to have it for sure because we didn't have at least um, 20% down if you owe less than, if, excuse me, if you owe more than 80% of the value of your home, they require you to have an escrow account for a lot of loans, a lot of different types of mortgages. They do that. So homeowners insurance, $140 and 30 cents per month for three months. We had to pay that at $420 and 90 cents. Uh, mortgage insurance again, <laughs> noted here, but, um, that was noted up above. Property taxes, we were supposed to pay four months in advance for that. So $444.88 per month came to $1,779. And then there was an aggregate adjustment of one of those months. So we ended up really only paying three months. And that total came to $1,755. In other, I think this might have been our, home, our inspection. Yeah. Um, so $350 and other, there was nothing here that we had to pay for all of these, but we did pay for the whole house inspection. We chose to not do a rate on inspection when he came. And these were all the things the sellers had to pay. So tons of stuff with the title, the real estate commissions for the, the two different agents, plus um, the home warranty. They threw in a one year home warranty. So they paid for that. And then they had, they got an attorney for their end of things. So they paid for that. So our totals, just so you can see, our totals were $10,603. Theirs were $14,660. Not that I was so concerned about that. I just thought I would share that with you so you'd see it. So total cl closing costs were $10,603. Now that's not necessarily what we paid. When you scroll down here, you can see here, Closing costs paid before closing by the buyer. That's us. We paid $920 out of pocket before closing. Closing costs that were financed. This is the uh, private mortgage insurance. So $3,124 was thrown into the loan. Down payment from the borrower or the buyer. Uh, that's us, $6,475. This was 3.5%. I will get you the totals here in a minute. We put a $1,000 deposit down at the time that they accepted the offer. 
So it was earnest money, if you will. And we had negotiated that they pay $5,000 of our closing costs. So they threw in $5,000, which re was really just a reduction of our loan. And then the property taxes paid by seller. This is the property taxes from 2020 <laughs> that will transfer over. And I don't know how to describe that any other way, but basically they were paying for the property taxes that we're gonna to have to pay for in 2021. I don't have a better way to describe that. <laughs> so anyway, the cash to close from buyer. So we started with the 10,603. We took, we, we basically just added all of this together and at the end there was $1,886.03 left over. That is the amount of the check that I had to write the day of the closing. And you have to write a check or had to have a certified uh, a cashier's check from the bank or something along those lines. So $1,886 is what we paid on the day of the closing. Now, let's go back up to the top and let me scroll over here. All right, now this is the more traditional view and probably what you guys wanted to see more than anything. And that is, you know, just the loan amount total was $181,649. And I just realized I didn't put the purchase price anywhere on here. We bought our home for $185,000 and the loan amount total ended up being $181,649. The interest rate was 2.625%, which was fantastic. We were so excited about that. And then this is the breakdown of our payment every month. So we're gonna pay $729.59 for monthly principal and interest, $140.30 for homeowner's insurance, $444.88 for property taxes each month, and $125.17 for our private mortgage insurance, which we will have to do until we get this loan down below 80%. So the mo monthly payment total will be $1,439.94, and you will be seeing in our budget reports, we rounded it up to $1,450. So that's what we will be paying each month. Now, this is another look at the out-of-pocket expenses that we had total. Our earnest money, we put $1,000 uh, down on the day that they accepted the offer. The appraisal fee was 515, the pest inspection was 55, the full house inspection was 350. Another common inspection that gets done in a house that has a fireplace is of the fireplace. When we called to have that done, the it was funny because the our real estate agent actually called somebody that they knew and that she knew and when she called and talked to him, he said, "Oh, I was just out there just like 5 months ago. I was out over the summer. They were getting ready to list the house. And so they had me come out and do a thorough inspection. And I did several things and I have the sales ticket. If you'd like to see it, he said, I'd be glad to come out and do another, another inspection for them. But I stand by my work and I think it's in good shape and doesn't need to be inspected again. So we decided not to do that. And that inspection is $149. I know that because we had that same inspection done on our, at our old house. Cause we had a fireplace over there. So we ended up not having to pay that 149 for the new house. So that was a nice little coincidence that she called the same place. And then of course we had our cash to close of 1,886. So our total out of pocket was $3,806. And then this is just showing that the seller paid uh, $5,000 in closing costs. And where we started with our offer was actually asking for $7,000 in seller paid closing costs because we wanted to make sure that we got five. If we could get more than five, great, but we wanted to make sure that we walked away with 5,000. So like I mentioned, I love a good spreadsheet and that means that I keep our uh, family budget in a spreadsheet format. I actually use Google Sheets for us and I sell it out on our Etsy shop. I sell it in both Google Sheets and Microsoft Excel format. So if you are interested in checking it out, see if maybe it can help with your budgeting. I encourage you to head over to my Etsy shop, which is linked in the description box below, and see if you think that might be able to help you. Another thing that's out there, I have tons of debt and savings trackers out there that will motivate you visually to help you keep chasing your financial goals. 
Don't forget to like this video and subscribe and make sure you share it with your friends. If you have somebody that you think might benefit from this information, please feel free to share it. It helps my channel every time you like, subscribe, comment, share the video, all of that helps the channel grow and that helps me continue to bring content to you. Now let's continue the conversation right over here with this video that YouTube has selected just for you. Click on it and I will meet you over there.